Welcome to our annual Holocaust Memorial Day service. I'm Fiona Howarth, the Associate Priest here at St. Peter Mancroft. This year, our service is different from our annual service. The serious nature of the pandemic means that we can't gather together as we would wish to, but we thank all of the many people who have worked together to bring this service to you, both those you will see and hear, and those who have do done so much of the planning behind the scenes. I'm Rabbi Roderick Young, a member of the Norwich Hebrew Congregation and the Norwich Liberal Jewish Community. Shabbat, the Jewish Sabbath, begins at sundown every Friday with the lighting of at least two candles. Shabbat ends at sundown on Saturday with the lighting of a single candle composed of many wicks. The candles symbolise the light and warmth that Shabbat brings weekly into our lives. At Hanukkah in December, we light a candle every night until on the final night, our menorah is ablaze with nine candles. The light of the Hanukkah candles symbolises the miracles that can happen in a war-torn world. Hanukkah candles dispel the deep darkness, just as do the lights of Diwali for Hindus and the lights of Advent for Christians. In the ancient Jewish temple in Jerusalem, there hung an everlasting light. Now, its descendant lights burn in synagogues and churches around the world. But all of these lights mean nothing if we humans don't take that light and spread it far and wide. In small ways or great ways, every human is called upon to make a difference, to be a light in our broken world, and to help ensure that the genocides that we are remembering today are never repeated. Lighting candles is lovely, but what practical action will I take, will you take, to make life better for the victims of war and genocide? That's the challenge thrown out by the light of every single candle. The psalmist says, O Zahroa la tzaddik. A harvest of light is sown for the righteous. Like a candle, each of us must be the light in the darkness. Well, I was born in Munich, in the capital of Bavaria. I had a bigger brother who was not always my delight because being four years older than me, he liked teasing me. Apart from that, I had a nanny and she used to take me for a walk to the nearest little park. And then I went to a kindergarten and then at the age of six, I started school. So I was there from six to seven and seven to eight. And that's when they beat up my dad. Hitler had come to power by then few weeks before and my parents took me out of this regular state primary school and put me into the Jewish school. From the moment that Hitler came to power and the incident with my dad occurred, I think I knew that I was in the category that wasn't just Bavarian, that I was, my identity was more obviously being Jewish and different from other Bavarians. Well, it was the 10th of March, 1933, which happened to be a day I was in bed with a little cold, nothing serious. And I heard the front door of our fourth floor flat banging shut, thinking it was my mum coming home from shopping. 
and that she'd come and say hello to me, but nobody came in. I thought that was a bit odd, so I got up, opened the door to the corridor, which was opposite the bathroom, outside which were pegs that my dad always hung his clothes on. And sure enough, there was my father's suit, but it was covered in blood, which for an eight-year-old was a shock, as you can imagine. So I tiptoed down the corridor, knocked at my parents' bedroom door, opened it and just saw my father pulling up his bedclothes so I shouldn't see his face. So I went back to bed and I lay there, I guess in sort of shock, because I couldn't understand what was going on. After that, there was the doctor came and then we went to our little house in the village uh, called Walchensee, where my dad recovered. <clears throat> but nobody ever told me anything. I think they tried to protect me. I think leaving Munich at midnight, for me at first, was a real adventure. I mean, it was midnight, it was my fellow cooks and my mum and my dad and my uncle with a camera. And then, of course, the time came and the train left. And it was a steam train, so it moved out very, very, very slowly. But I still saw my mum step behind my dad and dab her eyes. So, but she tried, she hoped that I would not see her cry. And that was the first time that the separation hit me. You know, up to then, it was me getting on the train, great fun, you know, I was going to England, I knew where I was going. Uh, there were no uncertainties at that point. But when I saw my mum cry, I think it was then that the fact was that I was going to be on my own. And I was met by, I guess, what looked to me like an elderly probably just a middle-aged lady, in a purple suit. Now, why that struck me, and I can see it now. And she greeted me by giving me her hand and said, how do you do? And I took her hand and I gave a little curtsy, which is what one, of, one did in my time, in my place. And I said, yes. So that was my first use of English in the UK. You know, they were very nice and very helpful, um, but it was being thrown into the English pool at the deep end. What I really, really, really wanted, and we're now talking about first week of July, I wanted to go to school and I was really, really keen to learn English quickly and well. And I said to myself in German, ich werde diese Sprache bemeistern. I shall master this language. And I think I have. I love English. So there was a magazine called Picture Post and this was one of the pictures. And it wound up in our common room. And I picked it up, turned the pages and came across my dad. I had not been in contact with my parents. I cried and Miss Borner, who was supervising prep, took us both to the headmistress's drawing room and said to her, oh, she says that this is her father. And the headmistress looked at it and then looked down at me over it and then looked again and then said, that is not your father, that is propaganda. I did not argue with her. That was the first time when I was all of 14 years old I realized that people could not understand what had gone on and what was going on in Germany. I was asked last year to give the opening speech to the Holocaust Memorial Day service on the 27th of January 2020. A lot has happened since then, not all of it good, as we find ourselves in the midst of a deadly 
coronavirus pandemic. Many people are understandably pondering on their own mortality, and this is not confined to the sick and elderly, but includes those who might have otherwise never have given it a thought and gone about their lives, particularly young, thinking that, and acting as if they will live forever. Not in this life, though. All the more real to those, who have, those of us who have known friends and relatives who have succumbed to COVID-19. This is a shock to us personally and a shock to our life for the duration. Who amongst us would have believed it possible that the whole country would see civil liberties restricted so with the lockdown imposed on most every community in the land? This is the United Kingdom. Things like this don't happen to us. They do now. Who would have imagined it? None of us. It is inconceivable. It was unimaginable. But we're living it now and we know it. This is the Holocaust Memorial Day service for 2021. I know of the Holocaust, but I don't truly know it. I didn't live through, through it. How could I truly know what it was like? The death, destruction, inhumanity and terror meted out to about nine and a half million of the, the European Jewish community by the Nazis. Also unimaginable and I might also have been thought inconceivable before it happened, leading to the murder of six million Jews. This is why we encourage, promote and support Holocaust Memorial Day, the International Day on the 27th of January to remember the six million Jews murdered during the Holocaust under Nazi persecution and in subsequent genocides across Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia and Darfur. The 27th of January marks the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau, the largest Nazi death camp. This is why Holocaust Memorial Day is still necessary to remind us and to remember those who have suffered in extremists beyond our imagination. Most of us didn't experience Nazi instigated Holocaust, so it is right and proper that we have an annual Memorial Day to not just remind us, but also to introduce this fact. And to those of us who don't know, don't really know what it was like. So Holocaust Memorial Day is necessary, but is it sufficient? No, it isn't. Holocaust Memorial Day is about you and me right here, right now, every day. It's not only about the horrors of the past, it is about the way we live and the way we think now. There may be a, dis a disconnect here for some who haven't given enough or any thought about these historical horrors, not thinking that any of this could possibly happen here, not in the 21st century UK, but human nature hasn't changed any since World War II. Who last year would have thought we would be in a deadly pandemic now? In my speech last year, I was advised that, in my civic role as Lord Mayor, I couldn't be political. They were correct, of course, insofar as being party political is concerned. But fascism, in all its forms, goes beyond this. Make no mistake, standing up for people's rights goes beyond party politics, beyond national borders. Hence, last year's theme was standing together. Whatever your politics, ethnicity, religion, gender, age, sexuality or nationality. This year's theme is Be the Light in the Darkness, and this naturally refers to the here and now. It's about you and me. It isn't about only the past, but about how we think and act now. Holocaust Memorial Day is here to act as a catalyst to make us think. I'm reminded on a daily basis the need to protect people's rights in my day job representing Norfolk people at tribunals. It's a cliche that sometimes the law can be an ass, but tragically, it can be more than that, as became apparent in 1930s Germany under the Nazi regime. An affront to everyone, not just the Jewish population, it was hijacked to persecute and ultimately used to commit mass murder. Dealing with legal challenges every day, it can sometimes feel as though the world is going to hell in a handcart. I don't have clients who don't have problems. There are people though, positive thinkers, who have addressed problems of anti-Semitism by persistently pursuing, through respectful and mutually beneficial discussion and negotiation, even with Holocaust deniers, and succeeded in getting them to see the light in the darkness, and to be the light in the darkness. It is possible to change people, change the way they think and act. You can read how in Matthew Syed's book, Rebel Ideas. I do believe in redemption and rehabilitation first, above retribution. 
much less on turning our backs on people who have lost their way, for whom we need to be their light in the darkness. This is not possible if we stop talking to them. I like to think of myself as a positive thinker, a glass half full sort of person, to see the good in people and in situations, but I'm reminded via 24 hour news channels that evil does exist in the world. It's having a certain view of the world though that encourages us, encourages me anyway, to do what I can for people in the here and now, to try my best to be the light in the darkness. It's hard sometimes, but it's important not to let others define who you are and what you're about. I'm not the only one to think this way. I recently read a book by a 100-year-old Eddie Yaku entitled The Happiest Man on Earth. The book's subheading, the, the Beautiful Life of an Auschwitz Survivor. I couldn't help shedding tears reading it. You don't usually read the words beautiful and Auschwitz in the same sentence. He thought of himself as a German first and a Jew second. But that all changed when Eddie was arrested in 1938 when he was beaten and arrested to spend seven years in Buchenwald and then Auschwitz concentration camps. He was marched three times to the door of the gas chambers and was pulled out of the queue each time to have him work as a slave laborer instead. He lost his family and friends in the Holocaust. After the war, he vowed not to let the traumatic experiences he had been through to define him. He was lucky enough to be able to do just that to live the best life possible he could afterwards. He counts himself the happiest, men on, uh, happiest man on earth. His story and his attitude to life and those that perpetrated the horrors of the Holocaust are an inspiration. And I would encourage you to read his story, to get a first-hand account that we, we hope none of us will ever have to experience ourselves. Eddie is truly the light in the darkness. We need the Holocaust Memorial Day because it matters today and every day. The onus is to be the light in the darkness. It was a vacuum. So it's up to us to fill the darkness with light. It matters to me, and it does matter to you, what happens to other people. This was captured brilliantly by Pastor Martin D. Muller's poem, First They Came. First they came for the communists, and I did not speak out, because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out, because I am not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out, because I am not a trade unionist. And then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out, because I am not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. Thank you. This is the testimony of Hansu Mala, a Rohingya Muslim from Myanmar. She grew up in Tula Tolly, where the Burmese military committed a massacre in 2017. Hansu and her family escaped to a refugee camp in Bangladesh. The treatment of us Muslims was getting gradually worse and worse. In August 2017, the military were closely guarding and watching our village for no reason. Every few days, they would round all of us up. They would choose people at random, claiming they were suspicious characters. They would beat some, throw some into jail. We were living in fear. Whenever we would hear that the military is coming, everyone would be afraid and hide in the hills. If they saw a pretty girl, they would go after her and rape her. We witnessed how they beat, cut, and slaughtered all the innocent people. They made the Rohingya people dig their own graves. All the able-bodied men were told to dig the holes. In that hole, they threw all the bodies. They poured gasoline into the hole all over the bodies and set it ablaze. We saw everything they were doing. They have killed so many of us. Can you imagine how we feel?
1975, um, uh, just after New Year, April, uh, my family was having breakfast in the morning. Somebody knocked the door, the front door, was the Pol Pot soldier with a black uniform and the gun and pointed the gun at us, say that you've got to get out of your house right now or we shoot you. So myself, because I was about 14 or 13, 14, they forced me to work hard labor in the field, in the cornfield. They told us if anyone, a uh, soldier or teacher, anyone well educated, tell them uh, that you are what you are and then they send you to back to Phnom Penh. They send you to uh, to study. After three months, they will come back, uh, or you join your family. So my father talked with my mum, thinking, what shall we do? I remembered the night before he left the family to join um, training. Father gave me his necklace. He gave it to me and he said, uh, please look after this and look after your, your brother and sister, um, look after your mum. And I don't know when I come back now, you, it's your duty now to look after the family. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 at the time, I didn't have any emotion. We just feel, okay, you go now and three months you come back and take me with you kind of thing and I will see you again. We waited and waited. There's no news back at all. Then one day, they told us, oh, you're going to join your family now. I was so excited, my mum excited. And certainly somebody, the, 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 the farmer told us, hey, it's not true. They're not taking you back to Phnom Penh. They take you to feel the jungle. And we knew that we never go back. We knew this is a, it's a lie. They just want to kill us. And we knew the we never see our father again. We we keep hoping, but we knew that's this is impossible. They took us through the jungle until we got to the place, completely jungle, completely nothing there at all. They just left you there to die, basically. So my grandmother really hungry, so I fed her this egg to eat, boil egg. And she couldn't swallow it. She's she couldn't swallow. She couldn't chew because she's. She's too, too ill to eat anything. And I hold her hat in my arms like that. So that night we slept in the same mosquito net. Uh, nearly morning when I touch her, she felt, up, she, I felt cold. So we all wake up, woke up and look at her, she already passed away. I felt so sad to see her burn, burning, you know, cre uh, cremated um, underneath the pile of wood in the jungle after my grandmother died. They separated me, took me away to work in hard labor. I came to see them, but I can't stay there more than one day. I had to go back next day. And then found out my brother really ill, who was, must be six years old. His name was Sal. And I remember that morning, that day when I left, I heard my brother not, not shouting, but crying. He sworn to the communist Khmer Rouge, said, uh, you took my brother away. I never seen him again. You took my brother away. You are terrible. You burned to hell. I condemn you. Please stay, brother. I want you to stay with me. Don't go. Please don't go. He's begging me. And I can. He I could hear his voice now, cry and begging me not to go back. I I walked out in tears. I could not stop. I couldn't. And then when I got two days later, I, heard, I got the, the news from my mother said my brother died. Some people got the radio. We heard about Vietnamese uh, invaded Cambodia, so they forced me to join the the army. And I thought to myself, I never ever kill anybody. I don't. I can't refuse it. But I had to take the order. One day, we heard the sound of the tank, the ground shaking, everything, and we knew um, the Vietnam uh, the the Khmer Rouge soldier disappeared. Vietnamese was in the village already. That day, they put me in the uh, uh, brick oven, so we have to sit against the wall in circle in the oven. And I thought to myself that, that, that day, I thought, that's it, that's it, they're going to burn us alive in here. I didn't say nothing. I thought, I'm going to die. 
they uh, moved me to Siem Reap prison. And after many months um, in the prison, uh, I was released. So I we spent time in the refugee camp until uh, I found my cousin in uh, England. She sponsored me and through the Red Cross. So I came to England in, uh, in August 1987. All the memories in the killing field still with me every day. I had nightmare all the time, even the night before. Yesterday I had nightmare. I, I dreamt that I was there and I tried to escape from the water. And at some point I had I seen so many things. I seen that body next to me. I seen a lot of things. So I, I can't describe it, but it still upset me. It's, it's a really nightmare. Red, blue, yellow, green, white, purple, jasmine, orange, azure. Old pallors make way for new homes, a future spread with colours. A horizon without sorrow, here ends our pain. Here begins life. We light candles to remember the victims of the Holocaust, of the genocides in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia, and Darfur. We also light an additional candle to remember all those suffering from persecution, conflict, and violence today, among them the Rohingya. We invite you to share in this moment of silence by lighting your own candle as you watch. The theme of this year's Holocaust Memorial Day is Be the Light in the Darkness. In 1944, Hannah Senesch, a 23-year-old Hungarian Jew, was shot by the Nazis. She had worked for the resistance and after her capture had been tortured to reveal her accomplices. She revealed nothing, but she left behind some beautiful poetry and prose. And these are the words of Hannah Senesch. There are stars whose light reaches the earth 
only after they themselves have disintegrated and are no more. And there are people whose scintillating memory lights the world after they themselves have passed from it. These lights, which shine in the darkest night, are those which illumine for us the path. May all those whose lives were cruelly taken and whose memories were recall with these candles shine forever as a blessing in our lives. Let us pray. God of the past, present and future, we remember today the six million Jews murdered in the Holocaust, the millions of other victims of Nazi persecution, and all those who have been targeted and killed in subsequent genocides. We give thanks to you for those who have survived and for the lessons of human stories, both in their suffering and in their joy. We remember those who have stood up against injustice and saved lives, giving thanks to you for their example. Together we acknowledge the sacrifice of those that stood together with those who suffered during the Holocaust and other genocides. And we affirm that every life is loved by you and is sacred. Yet we know too how we have also failed to stand with our neighbours. Oppression continues to stain your world and contradict your love. We pray that you will inspire us now as we stand together on this day in the love that we know of God in Jesus Christ. Help us to commit to remembering and to glorify you in our words and in our actions as we lay before you all of our prayers and seek to journey into a more peaceable and loving future for all people who share this common planet home. Amen. This Hebrew prayer 
is traditionally chanted for the souls of the dead. El male rachamim, shochein bamaromehim, hamatsei menucha nachana, tachat hanfei hashchina, bamaalot kedoshim otahorehim, kazoha harakia masirim, et nishmot achenu asher nishpach. Damim kamaim, vashe abdu mipne hamat hamezik. Be art sot tahat memshelet germania. Anaba al harachamim, hasirem besete kanfecha le olamim. Utsro bitsro hachaim et nishmatam. Adonai hu nachalatam, v'yanucho v'shalom ha-mishkavam, v'nomar amen. Exalted, compassionate God, grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence among the holy and pure who shine brightly in the firmament. To our brothers and sisters whose blood was spilt and who perished, at the hands of the Nazi oppressors in the countries that they tormented. Merciful one, we ask that you shelter them forevermore under the cover of your wings. May their souls be bound up in the bond of life. God is their inheritance. May they rest in peace. And let us say, Amen. Kaddish means sanctification. And the mourner's Kaddish is a prayer that an individual says for a loved one who has died. The mourner's Kaddish nowhere mentions death, but rather it praises God and looks forward to the time when God's kingdom will embrace all humanity. Yitkadal v'yitkadash me rabah, be'alma divra kirute v'yamlich malchute, Bechayachon of Yomechon, Uchaye de Cholbeit Israel, Bagalav with man Kari, Vemru, Amen. Yehesh me Rabba Mavarak, the Olamul Mayal Maya. Yet Barak for Yishtabak, Viet Paavi, Yet Ramam, Viet Nase. Viet Adavi, Yet Alevi, Yet Alal, Shmede Kurisha, Brechu. La Ela, Min Kolbechata, Veshirata. Tushbechata, Venechemata. The Amiran Belma Vemru Amen. Yehe Shlama Rabba Min Shemaya, the Chaima Lenu, the Al Kol Israel, Vemru Amen. O say Shalom Bim Ramav, who ya as say Shalom, Alenu, the Al Kol Israel, the Al Kol Yosh Ve Tevel, Vemru Amen. We believe the Holocaust must have a permanent place in our nation's collective memory. We honour the survivors still with us and reaffirm our shared goals of mutual understanding and justice. We must make sure that future generations understand the cause of the Holocaust and reflect upon its consequences. We vow to remember the victims of Nazi persecution and all genocides. We value the sacrifices of those who have risked their lives to protect or rescue victims as a touchstone of the human capacity for the good in the face of evil. We recognise that humanity is still scarred by the belief that race, religion, disability or sexuality make some people's lives worth less than others. Genocide, anti-Semitism, racism, xenophobia and discrimination still continue. We need to share responsibility to fight these evils. We pledge to strengthen our efforts to promote education and research about the Holocaust and other genocides. We will do our utmost to make sure that the lessons of such events are fully learned. 
We will continue to encourage Holocaust remembrance by holding an annual UK Holocaust Memorial Day. We condemn the evils of prejudice, discrimination and race. We value a free, respectful and democratic society. The Reverend Fiona Howarth and I will leave you with a final benediction. The oldest Hebrew blessing in existence from the Book of Numbers. Yivarechacha Adonai v'yishmarecha Ya'er Adonai panav elecha v'kunecha Yisa Adonai panav elecha v'yasem lecha shalom May God bless you and keep you May God's presence shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God's presence be with you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>